Glory to his name. I think my favorite line from that song is, there from the dark he brought me into marvelous light, out of the dark into marvelous light. If we look around today, it feels like there's so much darkness. We just have to turn on the TV. We have to open social media. And we're reminded of how dark the world is. But as a follower of Jesus, we have hope. We have hope because God is not done. What God started, he is going to work out. We have to hold on to that hope. We have to hold on to that faith in some days harder than we do other days. But God is good and he is so faithful. We do want to keep our country in prayer um, and President Trump as well. Just continued healing for him. Um, again, it sometimes seems dark days. We question what is going on, but we have to hold on to God. God is in control. It doesn't matter who is named president. God is in control and he is good. And now it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our guest speaker, Patrick Gratch. Patrick is the founder and lead pastor of Lifehouse Church in Hagerstown, Maryland, with campuses in Frederick, Maryland and Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. He also serves as the visionary founder of the Lifehouse Network, which has planted 12 churches and partnered to plant 45 others. He's married to Laura for 25 amazing years, and they are the proud parents of six kids ranging from 5 to 23 years old, and his daughter Bethany is with him as well today. Currently wrapping up his Doctor of Ministry from Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida, Patrick is also an avid endurance athlete, tackling marathons, triathlons, and enjoys the occasional hunting adventure. Patrick, why don't you join me on stage? Let's give him a big welcome. We are so glad to have you here with us. I believe this is your third time it with is. us. Yeah. So we're so thankful and we're so honored that you are taking up a busy, busy schedule to come share with us. Hey, thanks, Pastor Sarah. You know, I, I'm actually not a fan of, like, introductions. Uh, they asked for a bio, and I didn't even think that you guys were going to read it. I'll tell you why, because I would vastly prefer if the way I was introduced was like, hey, we found this guy on the street, and we wanted him, we thought he would be really good to speak, then the expectation would be real low, but now you got introduced like that, and I feel like the pressure's on, but I've been here before, so at the very least, you know, like you have an idea of what to expect if you've been around. Let me just ask this, how are you doing? No, 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 hold up. No, no, it's a funny question. Think about the wording. Isn't that such a weird question? How are you doing? Why not ask, like, how are you being? What does what you do reveal about who you are? Because the reality is, what you do reveals who you are. Your doing reveals your being. So if I were to say, how are you doing? I'm actually pushing in, and I can find out how you're being based on what you're doing. Do you like what you're doing is showing others about your being? Hold up, pause. Because you know what? We can like hear sermons and just kind of like brush off like important moments. So let's just pause. Do you like what you're doing is telling others about your being? In essence, do you like what they're seeing? You know, we often want people to judge us by our intentions. We want them to give us the benefit of the doubt and assume the best about us. We want others to judge us by our intentions. But you know how you judge other people? Not by what they meant, 
not by their intentions. We judge people by what they actually do. I don't care what you meant to do. I care what you actually did. This causes some rifts in marriages and homes because we, it's hard, you can't read between the lines to know what they meant. You got to actually interpret what they said. You can't, you can't figure out what the heart is. You just have to figure out what they actually did. And you know, in my home, this is a reality. We've got six kids. And so there isn't there in the inevitable disagreement or misunderstanding. I mean, just rarely, but it does happen on occasion. And uh, you know, so what do you do? You're, you're trying to help interpret, make sense of what somebody did and how that reveals who they are. And so let's, let's get the focus off of us for a moment because this starts to get uncomfortable. I can see some of you squirming. So what about the other person? What they do reveals who they are. And so you've gotten good at reading who people are by what they do. Some of you are really good at this. Women, you might call this like that sixth sense or like an intuition, right? Like some of you are good at reading people. You just get a sense of whether they're trustworthy or a creep. I have this skill too. Um, every young man that's ever asked to date one of my daughters, I intuitively knew was a creep. Just, it was a gut, deep gut feeling. I just knew it. So then you start scouring the internet, doing research. I call up some of my law enforcement friends. Hey, can you do a search? <laughs> No, right? Because you know, your gut tells you there's something wrong with this person. And then how do you know if you're right? How do you know? So hey, this is, what a gift to be able to come here. Um, my family and I are actually leaving for vacation as soon as I finish preaching. We're gonna, I'm going to drive home. We're all going to jump in our little crazy minivan. And we're going to drive for our vacation. But I love that I get to be here with you guys. Um, one of the things I appreciate is... I get a chance to interact with Pastor Keith a good bit, and I, I love his heart. I, it's okay, you can clap. You're allowed. You know, take a moment. <laughs> this, this isn't a setup. Yeah, I'm not going to, like, bait you into something here. No, like, you have an all-in pastor who leads an all-in team, who just wants to make a difference in the church and in the community. Pastor Keith, thank you. Thank you for your heart, for leading the church. When you have a pastor that's dedicated and all in, leads his family in being all in, leads a team in being all in, it shows. It shows, right? And in fact, that's kind of getting at my point, is what someone is shows. If they're a creep, it shows. If they're trustworthy, it shows. If they're all in, it shows. Let, let me illustrate this. Um, several years ago, I was not feeling good. And, I, and I'm one of those guys, like you, you heard my bio, I'm, a, I'm an endurance athlete, and one of the kind of the rules of endurance sports is suck it up and keep going. Like, you, you inevitably feel pain, and you interpret pain like, all right, what does that mean? And no matter what it means, just keep going. And uh, so I started not feeling good. I had kind of like, I felt like I had a knife stuck in my gut. But whatever, suck it up and keep going. And so I didn't know that I had a ruptured appendix for 10 days. I preached two weekends, five times each weekend, having no idea that I was on the verge of dying. And, and uh, I didn't know what was wrong. And 99% 99, 99 of the people that interacted with me had no idea I wasn't feeling good at all. I had stopped eating. I, finally, I stopped drinking fluids because it just was making me feel so crummy but I had already gone to the doctor my white blood count blood cell count was fine and I had no temperature there was like nothing in my blood system and so they're like yeah you're fine maybe you have like some chronic disease go home so at this point I've stopped eating drinking my wife's like something is seriously wrong you need to go back to the doctor so that that Sunday I went to church I was I, I preaching between services I went to one of the guys who's an ER doctor he was uh, working production on our staff, on our team that day. He, he checks me out and he goes, you have a serious problem with your appendix. You need to get to the ER now. I said, well, we got two more services. 
I got to preach. He goes, all right, between each service, I'm going to check in with you. And, we're, and, and if like, I don't like what I'm seeing, you're going to the doctor. Like, you're going to ER now. So we finished the three services, and we rushed off to the hospital. Um, turns out that I had like a ruptured appendix, and I was in really bad shape. Here's the deal. Even if it's a medical crisis going on on the inside, eventually it's going to show. You can only hide it for so long. What, what you are on the inside will show itself by what you do on the outside. It's not a threat. It's a caution. Now, good news, there's this, there's this guy. He was an outsider to the faith of the Bible. The faith of the Bible would be Judaism and Christianity. This guy was an outsider to that. He was actually a complete pagan. Um, but he met people who went to church. And he liked what he saw so much that he became... Uh, intrigued and started investigating their story. His name was Luke. He was a doctor. Uh, he was an educated guy, and he began to investigate the early church and the story of Jesus to the point where he traveled to where Jesus lived. He probably interviewed Jesus' mom, Mary. He probably interviewed Mary Magdalene. He interviewed several of the people that interacted with Jesus. He became persuaded that Jesus is who he said he was. And so Luke eventually writes a historical account of the life and teachings of Jesus called, in your Bible, the Gospel of Luke. And he writes a second account of the early church called the Book of Acts. In Luke, we get this moment where Luke records a teaching of Jesus on the topic that what you are shows by what you do. Luke chapter uh, 6, starting in verse 43. He says this, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Wow. There's a challenge there. A saying I have come up with that I use pretty frequently is, what fills, spills. So I'm going to invite you to say it with me. Everybody say, what fills, spills. All right, one more time. What fills, spills. What's in you? will come out of you. This happens frequently in my home. My kids has a cup, and the cup gets knocked over. What was ever, whatever was in the cup comes out of the cup. If one of my boys puts milk in the cup, you knock it over, water doesn't come out. You put bad in the cup, you knock it over, guess what spills out of it? Bad. You put good in the cup, and you knock it, guess what splashes out? Good. Jesus is saying, you want, you want apples, you got to go to an apple tree. You want oranges, you got to pick from an orange tree. What people are picking from your life reveals what's in you. In essence, the fruit exposes the roots. Your fruit exposes your root. Now, if you've ever, I, I would say this is a privilege. If you've ever been with someone, in their last days. It's a privilege because the things you hear there are precious. They're not telling you the secrets about business. They're not telling you their funniest story. They talk to you about things that matter most. And, and if you've ever been in those moments, you lean in a little bit. And you listen carefully. And, and often you think to yourself, I'll never forget this moment. I'll never forget what they said. Now imagine instead of being, you know, just a, a, not just, but a family member, a loved one. Imagine it's Jesus. You get to be with Jesus in his last moments, last days, before he leaves, before he dies. Jesus takes his friends on a walk after he leads them and he washes their feet to teach them that he, he came to be a servant, 
and not a master. He leads them in a, in a meal, celebrating the Last Supper, communion, what you just enjoy. My body broken for you. My blood spilled for you. And then they go for a walk. And they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is going to weep and be broken in prayer. And on the way, they pass a vineyard. And Jesus begins to teach, and he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. This is John chapter 15. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you remain in me, and I also will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And then in verse 8, he says, This is to the Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Showing yourself to be my disciples. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Did you catch it? Jesus is talking about this idea that, um, like we got this idea that bad trees produce bad fruit, good trees produce good fruit. And then the last things Jesus leans in and teaches are, if anything good is going to come out of your life, it's going to come because you remained in me. You have to get connected to me. You've got to abide in me. You've got to remain in me. And if you remain in me, something begins to change in your life. Here, here's the key. The, the, the first lesson you can learn from this is that it is not about doing, but being. You've you got to be it before you can do it. So the, the, what, I, what I would challenge you with is this. In fact, I, I think we have a photo for you. Do you guys have that, the picture of like the vine and the, and the grapes? I don't know. If, there you go. Okay, so look at this picture, right? The fruit comes out of, the, out of the, the, the branches that are connected to the vine. The key, Jesus is saying, is that you have to remain connected to the, to the vine. If you're disconnected, what happens? You die. And if the branch is not connected to the vine, and it dies, there's no fruit. The only fruit is death. So you, you got to be connected. So what's the key to anything that's produced from your life? It's about being connected to the vine, right? You with me so far? Okay. So it's, what's the key for us? The lesson is focus on being, not doing. The doing is the result of the being. So, mu so many times we ask questions like, how are you doing? In, the, in, the, in this community, we should be saying, how are you being? How is, you, how is your being? Are you present with God? Are you being with Jesus? Here's the deal. If we don't focus on the inside, if we're only focused on the outside, the outside will die. There, there, there is no fruit if, there aren't, if we aren't connected to the root. There's a disconnect between us and God. We're already dead, and, and that's actually kind of the point is, let me, let me just dive in and give it to you this way. Um, I, I will say this. You and I were born separated from God. There's a disconnect. The branch was broken away from the vine. And as a result, and now how is it broken off? There's this spiritual brokenness inside of us. A spiritual separation called sin. And sin that separates us from the vine of relationship with God leaves us spiritually dead. Now, I have, I planted a, uh, a vine in, the, in our backyard. I thought it looked really cool. I put up those little uh, string lights in my backyard, and then we, I, put a, I put a little, uh, little grapevine there. And over the years, it's grown, and now it's spread out. Now, I hope this never happens, but if somebody were to break off one of the branches connected to the vine, if you broke it today, you wouldn't know it was broken today. Why? Because the leaves would still be green. There's actually grapes right now growing on them. Now, you know what it would do? A couple days from now, no matter how much you watered the vine, the branch would start to wither. The fruit would dry up. So you can look 
like you're connected, but be dead. And over time, death becomes the fruit of a dead branch. So what happens is sin that separates us from relationship with God eventually starts to produce the fruit of sin and death. And it leads to a forever far from God. Well, if you've got a branch that's producing bad things or death, what do you do? Well, what you do is you need Jesus, the God of the universe, to come from heaven to earth, to give his life, to die, to take on the eternal punishment for sin on himself, to die in our place, so that branches that were once dead can be grafted into the living vine and brought supernaturally back to life. Right now, if in your life you don't like what's coming out of you, you got to get connected to the vine. If, if bad's coming out of you because you know, even if no one else knows about you, there's some bad in there, you need to get connected to the good vine. If you're not absolutely confident that there is spiritual life inside of you, you got to get connected to Jesus, the eternal life of God. And so what he does is he invites us to believe in him by faith, where we are then grafted into the vine of God. When you believe in Jesus, you are forgiven. You're given new and forever life. You're grafted in. And now when you're connected to the living vine of God, when you're connected to the life of God, the, the sap of God that comes from the roots flows through the vine into the branches. Life begins to flow. The only thing you can do, what, what does a... What does a branch do to produce fruit? It doesn't do anything. It just stays connected. For you and I, we got to focus on being, not doing. Are you being with God? Are you spending time in God's word? Are you spending time in prayer? Being nourished by the presence of God. Being, not doing. Now, something happens. As you are being... Something begins to happen inside of you. Things start to grow from within you. And being becomes doing. Did you see the switch? Focus on being, not doing. But as you focus on being, not doing, the being in you starts to create doing. Things start to happen. You can't make it happen. You can't force it to happen. It just starts to happen. Being becomes doing. The life of God in you starts to produce things through you. Here's how Jesus said it. I'll just read it to you. I am the vine. You are the branches. This is uh, John chapter five, 15, verse 5. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Doing is the fruit of becoming. You can't make it happen. You can't force it to happen. It just begins to happen. Let me say it again. Doing is the fruit of becoming. I, having planted this vine in my backyard, I, did, I didn't do enough research, but I discovered over time that it takes about three years after you plant it. So that, that's year zero. That doesn't even count. Then you have three more seasons before you get any fruit. So every season, I would go out there and yell at the vine. Produce grapes! And I would slap it a little bit, and I would flick off a couple of the leaves because I was upset with it. I would go out there in the winter and just cut off all the extra shoots, disappointed and frustrated with it. I would try to whack it a few times to reprimand it, to produce. And finally, because I hit it enough times and I cut off enough shoots and I pulled off a few leaves to insult it by the third season it finally started producing some grapes no you know that's ridiculous no you don't prune it in frustration you you prune it in expectation 
you don't reprimand the branches. Over time, the being becomes doing. Just eventually, it starts to produce fruit. (sighs) There's something important about this. Jesus' very first miracle. If you you don't know, I'm going to tell you. John chapter 2, it's recorded. Jesus goes and he's with his friends, and he gets invited to a wedding. I don't know what picture you have of Jesus, but some of you have a picture of Jesus that would never get invited to a wedding party. Jesus was the kind of guy, him and his friends got invited to parties. And so Jesus, with his mom and friends, show up at at a wedding feast in Cana. Now, something you've got to know about weddings back then is the whole community came. It was a really big deal. There are still cultures around the world today that are like this. It's an entire community festival paid for by the bride and groom, which is a big deal in a shame, honor culture where the most important thing at stake at this party is their reputation. Their reputation that will open business opportunities in the future. Their reputation that is all about connection and networking in a shame, honor culture. So they're feasting and they're celebrating. The wedding is happening. By the way, it happens for about a week. Jesus and his friends are there. Everybody's having a good time. A whisper quickly makes its way to the host. We We ran out of wine. And in a culture where wine is the only sterile thing you have and this is what people drink, Running out of wine is not just a big deal. It brings great shame on the bride and groom. It will destroy their lives. Decades from now, people will bring this up when they're talking about whether you want to do business with them. No, I don't do business with them. They can't be trusted. He ran out of wine. So right now, his honor is on the line. His reputation, his future is on the line. Jesus' mother, Mary, comes and says, Jesus, they ran out of wine. What do you want me to do about it? Like, Ma, come on. (laughs) That's what I think. Um, And then Jesus pauses, and he simply goes, fill up those vases. Those vases, those big, um, like, rock vases would have equaled about 150 gallons of water. I don't know about you, that's a lot of wine. So he's, and he doesn't even make, he doesn't say what he's going to do. He just goes, fill those vases up with water. He doesn't even speak. He just says, draw from it and bring it to the host. So they, they draw from the water vases, bring it over. And you know this, if you know the story, the host drinks and goes, wait, what? Where was this wine at the beginning? This is the good stuff. Like you save the good stuff till, the, till later in the feast when half the people are a little tipsy and can't tell the difference between the good and the bad? There's no fanfare. There's no show. There was no waving his arms. There was no production. He just said, fill it up with water, and then it becomes wine. Why should that shock us? You know I'm going to connect the dots pretty quickly here for you. Why should it shock us? That Jesus would turn water into wine. He does it every single season. Every season, he's turning water to wine. Every day during this season when it's crazy hot, I have to go out with my hose, put it on my grapevine, and water it for a long time. Because it takes a lot of water to produce grapes. And then the grapevine does something miraculous it converts water into fruit. It becomes the wine. Listen to me. As you abide in Jesus, as you remain in Jesus, the life of God, the water of God is flowing from him into you. And a miracle is happening over and over and over in your life. God is converting water into wine in your life. He's converting water into a miracle in your life. You are the wine. Your life produces fruit from the water. Jesus, I am the living water, Jesus said. 
If he's the living water in you, then as the water begins to flow from him into you, the being produces doing. This is God's desire for your life. Jesus said it this way. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Right? You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can't produce anything. Because you're dead. There's no life of God in you. You, you, The only thing that's going to come out of you is death. But it gets even better. He goes, this is to my Father's glory. God, like, this is my worship. It's to the Father's glory. Not just that you produce meager fruit. Not just this. This is a tease. I give my kids these grapes, and they're like, can we have more? It's to the Father's glory that we produce much fruit. Showing yourselves to be connected to the vine. Showing yourselves being. The being becomes doing. You are called to good works. You are called to produce fruit. God isn't yelling at you. God is not reprimanding you. God is not whacking you with a stick saying, come on, grapes, grapes, grapes. God isn't withholding water so that you'll actually do something. God loves you. God cherishes you. God gave his life for you. You are precious to God. The, the, the branch is the strength of the vineyard. God doesn't want to discard you. He loves you. He is for you. He lavishes his goodness onto your life so that you become more like Jesus. And as you become, you are called to good works. Now listen to me. I want to make sure you don't miss this. The fruit of your life is a miracle. God is in the process of converting water into wine every day in your life. Every time you choose generosity over greed, that is the water becoming wine. That's fruit being produced from water in your life. God wants to do a miracle. Every time you want to react in anger, but you respond in kindness. It's the miracle of Cana, water to wine. Every time... You wish someone would take care of you and serve you and you choose to selflessly wash someone's feet metaphorically. That's the miracle. That's the fruit of good works. That's the water being converted to wine. I I wanna, there's 10 clusters in here. I mentioned about greed to generosity. And since I'm the guest here, I could say things like this. Pastor Keith, thank you. Can I encourage you and challenge you? I know there's some weird news going on. I mean, you got weird, you, got have, you have to get the law enforcement involved. That's crazy. You know how frustrating that is as a pastor trying to lead a church? And you know that like, fi- your division directs the money, right? Like I, I say this, vision directs finances, but finances paces the vision. And then you find out that somebody's been like robbing you. Like I wanna, I wanna go fight for you guys. But what I know is this. One, God's up to something. There's a miracle coming. And secondly, let me challenge and encourage you. You know what's interesting? God will give you this. There's 10 clusters here. All God's asking for in return is you to give him back this. Look at what God's creating with your life. He's doing miracles. Every one of these branches, every one of these clusters is a miracle. All he says is, would you take some of the miracle I put in you and I produce through you and would you give it back to me? And God will do more with this than with this if you'll trust him. Any, anybody who's not giving, can I challenge you? You're robbing yourself, not God. Because God will keep doing miracles. He'll keep turning water to wine. You and I are missing out if we don't give generously to God. So can I, can I just challenge you? I, I know it sometimes feels like, what am I giving to? You're giving to the kingdom of God. You're giving to eternity. You're giving to the church, which is what God set in motion to be the hope of the world. You're giving to the miracle of water becoming, oh, I'm 
stepping on grapes here and somebody's got to clean. I'm sorry. You're getting to the miracle of water becoming wine. Every time you give, every time, you are, you are recreating the Cana miracle of water to wine. Let me challenge you. When you open your mouth and you begin to tell people your story about how Jesus changed your life, water to wine. You're telling them the miracle of how God grafted you into a vine. His water flew through you and it started producing fruit. Your life worships God more the more fruit you produce. It's to the Father's glory that your life produces much fruit. Now let me give you one more key challenge before I land this. Your life should produce much fruit. You share some of that fruit by giving generously to and through the church. This is not the fruit of the church. The church does not produce fruit. You know what the church produces? A vineyard. Churches multiply vineyards. The fruit of an apple tree is not the apple. That's what you do. That's what we do in our personal lives. The fruit of the church is not, an, it's not apples. It's an orchard. You and I, as the church, are called to create and reproduce. That's why you're a church that's, that's doing their best to be a church unchurched people want to be part of. Because you don't just want to produce fruit. You want to produce a vineyard. That's why you're a church that's for the community. Because the goal is to be a church that produces grapes. It's to be a church that spreads the orchard. You with me? You're a church that's investing, that's giving, that's serving, that's loving. And you may not see the fruit just yet, but let me encourage you. I was thinking of praying this for Pastor Keith and your family. Your fruit, your best fruit is not growing on this tree. Your best fruit is growing on others' trees. It's growing on missionaries' trees. It's growing on other churches' trees. Celebrate it. That is what we're called to. You are called to good works. Your life produces fruit. But when you give to the church, and when you serve the church, and when you partner together as a church, you're not just producing fruit. You're spreading the vineyard. All right, so now I got to land this. Mostly because I need to go on vacation. <laughs> All right, but no, I, you could tell I, I've been praying for you. I, I love Victory Church. I pray for you regularly. Pastor Keith and I get a chance to have a meal once in a while together. I pray for you. I believe in what God's doing here. I believe in the miracles you've seen. I believe in the water to wine miracles in the past, but I believe that those ones in the past pale in comparison to what God is going to do. This means there are some of you here who've been disconnected from the vine and you need to say yes to Jesus and you need to allow God to graft you into his life and his love. And if you're saying yes to Jesus, make sure that you fill out the connection card. You let the team know that you're saying yes to Jesus so they can follow up with you and encourage you. Come forward and ask for prayer when we get to that moment. Many of you, maybe you're in the early years where the fruit's not growing yet. But many, many of you, would you allow the fruit to come from your being? God loves you. He just wants to produce more fruit through you. And the only thing you can do is just surrender to him and be obedient to him and love him more. And the more you love Jesus, the more generous you'll become. The more you'll tell others about how much you love Jesus. The more you'll serve because you're becoming like Jesus. And I believe that as a church, you're called to become a vineyard, not just a vine. Can I pray over you? Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us that much. That you gave your life to graft us into the living vine. Now, God, as we focus on being, not doing, would you begin to do miracles through us, converting water to wine? I believe there are miracle moments here today. God, of you converting water to wine in people's lives, healing a marriage, empowering someone to be a witness for you, turning someone who was previously greedy into somebody who's radically generous turning people who wanted to be served into servants. 
And God, as a church, pray that victory will become a, a vast vineyard with vines spreading throughout this city and this region, producing fruit in the darkest places. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, can I invite you to respond? There's, there's a prayer team available. You know that for each service. You can certainly come and receive prayer. Some of you, your prayer needs to be Jesus. I've been trying so hard to do that I forgot being. Others of you, it's reversed. You've been spending time with Jesus, but you need to allow God to produce things through your life. Would you pray? Give people a prayer. Receive prayer. Let God turn. Like when you come forward, I hope that many of you, your prayer is this. I just want God to do the miracle of turning water into wine in my life.